Hey fam, welcome to the Free Trail Podcast and our new presenting sponsor. We're so happy to now be working with The Feed. Thefeed.com forward slash free trail is where you need to go. It is the one-stop shop for all your training and racing nutrition needs. They have over 200 of the world's best nutrition brands stocked in one website. It's a fantastic resource. We've been big customers for a long time. We're really proud to work with them. Some of my favorite products that you can find at thefeed.com forward slash free trail. Gnarly Nutrition Whey Protein Powder. I like the chocolate flavor. I have some of this after every one of my workouts and long runs. For in-run nutrition, Orange Drank. You'll see my big dumb face on it. Also from Gnarly Nutrition, enhanced sodium concentration here in the world's best fueling drink mix. Finally, HVMN Ketone IQ. I have two of these ketone shots basically every single day, once before I go running and once in the middle of the afternoon when I need a little extra energy. Go to thefeed.com forward slash free trail and you're going to get an $80 credit, free money to spend at thefeed.com. It'll be $20 right away and then $20 every 90 days thereafter. You'll also get a sweet trail running will save the world water bottle. Again, that's thefeed.com forward slash free trail. You'll get $80 credit to spend on your favorite nutrition products. And if you are international, they do ship internationally as well. So you can take care or at least take advantage of that great offering from The Feed. Big thanks to The Feed for supporting and thank you for watching the podcast. Devin Yanko, welcome to the podcast. So great to have you here. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks for having me. I think hopefully we can get past the first 20 seconds on the second try. <laughs> yes, well. Yeah, we were battling a little technological issues here for our listening audience, but it seems like we are on it now. And I'm so glad to have you here. And we have so much to talk about. Obviously, you're only a few days removed from the conclusion of further Lululemon's incredible ultra event. And uh, also, you and I are sort of of the same vintage. We sort of came into the sport around the same time. You were one of the first athletes that I followed. I want to come back around and talk about that. Our stories overlap for a while in Marin County. And uh, yeah, there's a lot to your story that I hope to capture here in our first episode recording together. So I obviously do have to start Devin in the typical place. I sent you a prompt to make sure that you were <laughs> informed and prepared. The first question as is typical for everybody is what makes you, you please introduce yourself to the free trial audience. I'm sure most people know who you are, but tell us what makes you unique. Uh, I mean, I feel like that kind of question can spark an, some existential dread and like um, have a meltdown. Because what, what does make me me? Um, <laughs> but for the, for the audience, I will give you some of the things that I participate in um, so that you get a sense of what I do. Um, I am an ultra runner, trail runner, marathon runner. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, currently, I am a small, very small farm owner. Uh, I'm a coach. Um, jokingly, for during further, we started to joke that my bio should just be former everything. So like former <laughs> division one basketball player, former librarian, former bakery owner, former podcast host, former <laughs> like just listing all these things I used to do, which some of those things I still do in and out. But yeah, I, I mostly think I'm just a human having a human experience yeah. out there in the world. And you have had a very dynamic life, personally, professionally, athletically. So I'm sure we'll find ways to talk about that. But first, I want to talk about the fast foodie moniker. Because again, you and I are of the same vintage and you were one of the first people that I ever followed. And this is sort of at the advent of the social media era. And of course, I know the origin of fast foodie, but why don't you enlighten the audience of where fast foodie came from? Yeah. So in 2007, I went to culinary school um, and I did it for myself. I wasn't, I knew better than like to try to go into the restaurant industry. Um, I was doing it because I wanted to support my own running and everything else like that. Um, and yeah. And then it accidentally turned into a career first as personal chef and then as a restaurant cafe bakery owner. Um, but yeah, like for lack of a better, you know, when social media came around, <laughs> I just, it put together, it's really funny when I get tagged in on social media. Cause like foodie is such a loaded term, but like back then it was just like that 
I am fast and I really like food. So, well, it's, it's clever and it's easy to remember. So it's yeah. therefore perfect for what was your private personal chef business. And it's yeah. also perfect for your Instagram handle now, but I don't know. I think it's an interesting part of your story, just being in the culinary world. And we'll come around to talking about MHBB in that chapter of your life, but I'd be interested to hear more about where the culinary passion and profession was born. What led to going to culinary school? Um, it's actually funny because like growing up, single parent household, my mom was not a very good cook. Like she's very much, I don't know how old your parents are, but my my mom's in her 70s. And like that generation was really afraid of um, undercooking food. And so growing up, um, I was not a really big fan of food because I just associated it with like really overcooked things. <laughs> Thankfully, on the other side of the spectrum, my dad's partner when I was, you know, like early teens, she was like, she was an interior designer, but she was like mind, a mind blowingly good cook. Like she had lived in South America, in Asia, in the South, like all this kind of stuff. And every, I went from like eating chicken that I had to put mayonnaise on at home to like eating food that like just blew my mind. And so having those culinary experiences with my dad and my stepmom, like really started to pique my curiosity. And it's like, it's funny. The first thing I learned how to cook was like porcini mushroom risotto with like truffle. And like, I learned how to like grill a perfect flank steak. And I was like 14 when I learned how to do that. Right. So I had that side where I was like, I really appreciate good food. And, you know, when I would travel with my dad, around the world, like we'd go to the most amazing restaurants, we'd have those experiences. And then there's like this basketball playing swagger girl who eats McDonald's on the other side where like, as I went into college and like stopped playing basketball, it's like I still appreciated good food, but like, I didn't couldn't afford good food. And then yeah. as I came out of college, and I was like, living overseas, I would go to nice restaurants, and I just had that side of me. But the reason I went to culinary school is because I was like, okay, as a runner, everything I knew about nutrition was like stuck on one side, right? Like mm -hmm. if I want to support my running, I have to eat this way. Oh. And then if I want to enjoy food, I have to eat this way. And that didn't really make sense to me because I was like, it's all food. It should, you should be able to make those things to go together. So going to culinary school was a way for me to be like, can I eat amazing food? that also supports my running. And like the answer is yes. And now I find it really baffling when people don't think those things go together because they really do. It's interesting though, because most people would like go get a degree in sports nutrition and you decided to go the more practical route of like actually learning how to cook yourself. <laughs> so one thing I've never spoken to you about that I'd be really interested to hear is the history with Tartine. Obviously, I know your husband, Nathan, used to be a, uh, a baker at Tartine Bakery, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners have no idea what I'm talking about. So maybe <laughs> provide a, a history lesson about Tartine and how that ultimately created the conditions for MHBB, which we'll get to in a bit. Yeah, I mean, when Nathan and I were kind of introduced long story. We were, we were, we were told, I was told that Nathan existed and that what made us perfect for each other was that we were both runners we're and we both like food. Both. Um, so, um, yeah. So basically when I met Nathan, he was a baker at Tartine. Um, he had been there for, I don't know, eight or nine years by the time I met him. And, I mean, if you want to go see what Nathan looked like before he had a, a zillion tattoos, you can read the Tartine Bread book because he's in there. And Nathan essentially was Chad, the, the owner's right-hand man. Like, they were besties, and Nathan, like, that was a career place for him. And, you know, meanwhile, I was over, like, doing my own thing. And I always said, like, if you're ever interested in, like – going out on your own, I will support you and I will help you. Like, like I said, I didn't go into culinary to be in the food industry. So yeah, I mean, Nathan worked there for many, many years. And in, I remember it was, it had to have been April of 2011. I had just raced Mad City 100K and I came home and we went for a walk and Nathan told me that he was a year away from being a year away from leaving Tartine. <laughs> <laughs> so 
basically I knew we had a year before like to start the cultivation of our own idea. And ironically, we did open in May of 2013, our own business, um, MH Bread and Butter. So yeah, like, I mean, Nathan was educated at the Culinary Institute of America. Like he did both culinary and baking. Like if you want somebody to blow your mind on like anytime they make you anything, like Nathan is your person, like it's, kind of ridiculous, um, (laughs) how skilled he is. And I think, you know, in terms of bakers, like Nathan is probably one of the best bakers in the world, even though he would never tell you that. And he might not even know that for himself, but like, he's so humble and chill, but I always was like, yeah, let's, let's open a place because I know it will be good because of that skill level and that care and like just that taste level. So For me, it was a no-brainer other than the fact that I had to figure out how to actually operate a business for us. Yeah, it's so funny. And I can't remember if it was you who told me this, but one of the early sort of memories that I have of visiting MHBB, somebody made the comment to me that like, you know, Nathan is like a world-renowned baker. Like he went to the bread world championships or something like that. That's always stuck in my head is like there's a bread baking world championships and Nathan was a participant. I don't know if you want to tell that story. If there's a, if there's a gluten Olympics or whatever. Uh, well, there is, there is a, uh, a competition in which there is like uh, essentially what you were talking about. Um, Nathan hasn't actually participated in it, but um, Nikki Justo, who is a part of our community and our flower purveyor, um, actually has been on that team and led that team. And I think Nathan's had ample opportunity to join that team. But like, also when you're running your own business, you're not like, Hey, also let me go do this thing that requires like my undivided attention for like six months. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's come back and talk about that in a sec, but of course we need to bring your running story into the conversation here. Obviously, like I said, you and I sort of come from the same era in the sport. I remember sort of starting to follow your blog when I was getting interested and inspired about trail and ultra running. You ran your first ultra in 2006. I went and looked that up before we jumped on our call here today. So 18 years. So maybe like before we go back in time and talk about more of the stuff that you've accomplished, if there's anything you want to say about where you see yourself kind of in the arc of your career now and like maybe how your mindset and motivation has changed through that 18 years, just in general, before we get to some of the specific stuff. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I'm going to be 42 in June. Like I know I can see the, you know, I can see the horizon more so than I could in those early years. Like I still believe that I have like, I can still grow and, you know, run faster times and, you know, continue to develop as an athlete. I also know that from a physiological perspective, like my days are numbered and, you know, people get mad at me when I say that. And I'm like, I'm not being, I'm not being negative. I'm being like biologically accurate that like, I, I am not going to be able to run at my peak physical capacity for the, my entire life. Um, but I actually think this is probably the most fun part of my career because I, I feel like I have the most space to not, you know, it's not just about like achievement. It's about experience. And like, there's not a lot, there's nothing that I'm like, mm, like if my career ends tomorrow, I'm going to really regret X, Y, and Z not happening. Whereas early in my career, it was like, I was always striving for something. And now I'm just like, I just want to really enjoy the fact that I feel amazing about my fitness and my confidence is finally, you know, solidifying. And I actually don't care what people think. (laughs) And, you know, like it's a really like this age is just really fun and I just really want to enjoy it and like not let some of the things that got in the way when I was younger get in the way, like self-consciousness. So it's a fun time. Say more about that, because, of course, like we're both at similar, you know, points in our careers. We've both been in the game for a long time. I also feel that sort of closing of a window. But also, yeah, I don't know. I care a lot less about winning races and being on a podium as much as I just care about being healthy, being at whatever level of fitness that I can get myself to based on the other things that I care about in my life. 
and I think there's a lot of young athletes who may listen to the show or, you know, people in general who struggle to find that flow of like just being happy with where you are and not necessarily being bogged down or preoccupied by how other people might be perceiving you. Was there a, a moment in time where you feel like you were able to pass through that sort of valley of self-consciousness? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I think one thing that really helped me at the time didn't feel good, but it was probably very formative was when um, Hoka decided not to renew my contract. Um, and they basically just said, I said, well, why? What did I not do? And they're like, nope, just because we decided. And I was like, okay. Right. <laughs> and they did it at such a time that like, I didn't really have an opportunity to get anything in place for the next year. And I was sent out into this no man's land of like an unsponsored elite. And like at the time it felt really uncomfortable because our sport associates success. Like you are successful if you were sponsored. And like, I went into this space where I was like, well, how do I navigate the space that there aren't really that many people in and like, I don't have anybody to turn to. And like, I had to redefine that for myself. And like, thankfully COVID happened pretty there quick thereafter. And like COVID was the best year ever. Like I had the most fun running. Like I was crushing it. I was like, <laughs> man, if there had been a race, no one would have been able to beat me. Like I was doing ridiculous shit and I felt amazing. And like, it was that moment where I was like, I am having the most fun in my life and it's all on me. It's all for me. And I don't have any restrictions. Like nobody's going to show, tell me what to race anymore. Like no, no, there's no pressure. Like, yeah, there's pressure from like, the way we interpret the community saying like, this is valuable and this isn't, but like, ultimately I just got to do what I wanted. And so coming out of that, like, I just felt like I could be, do whatever I wanted and not self limit or not do things to please other people. And like, yeah. you know, you, you asked me beforehand about like my weaknesses and like one of my weaknesses by far and has hurt me a lot in my life. is like people pleasing or like if, if this, if I'm accountable to this person, I am going to blow your mind with how much I meet or exceed your expectations. Yeah. <laughs> and so like to remove that, right. Like I don't, I'm only accountable to myself. Right. And yeah. so therefore my definition of success started to change. And honestly, like when I then, and I kind of figured because I am old, I use a lot of air quotes about old because people, I'm not old. I don't think I'm old, but people have told me I'm old. So I just make a joke out of it. <laughs> I didn't think I would ever be sponsored again. Right. So like when I showed up at Havelina and like nobody paid me any mind. Like nobody interviewed yeah. me beforehand. I was like, sweet, let's roll. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I don't, I didn't have anything extra constraining me. And I can look back now and say, I can look at different points in my career and be like, Ooh, yeah, you really, you really, you know, did that wrong based on what, who I was sponsored by, what their expectations were. Mm. were. Like I changed myself 27 times over and it, wasn't satisfying and I this didn't is, get the best out of myself. This is, I think a, just a really important thing to emphasize with the audience is like, I think for a lot of people, the perception is that when you're an aspiring professional athlete, all you want to be is sponsored, but that there's also a certain level of freedom that comes from the removal of those expectations yeah. and of the, you know, devoting your athletic career to in some way service a brand or a corporation rather than servicing yourself and your own identity and your own, you know, motivations. So and interesting. I, I, um, Zach Miller actually wrote a piece recently that was like, uh, if I could send that to every like young athlete, it, it puts it perfectly. He uses the analogy of, uh, I think it's like Mary Oliver's bird by bird. Yes, and it talks about the difference bird. being, between being a writer and being published. And I think 
that's ex- when I read that, I was like, mic drop, like, yeah, like everybody needs to read that because there is a difference between trying to be a sponsored runner and like running because you love it and you are self-guided and that's what you care about. Yeah. It's funny. I had Anna Frost on a podcast recently and she espoused something similar to this and that 2024 this year is the first year. And I think the last 20 that she's entered a new season without a primary sponsor and that she just viewed it as this beautiful freeing opportunity in a new chapter in her life. And I don't know, I just think that's kind of a counterintuitive uh, disposition to have around what could otherwise be interpreted as the disintegration of a profession or of a career. Anyway, coming back to MH Bread and Butter, <laughs> aka MHBB, <laughs> it's one of, one of, it still is one of the great cafes and bakeries in Marin County, a, a holy place, especially for the local trail running community. And when you guys launched, I remember that you did a Kickstarter around it. And it just so happened that a lot of the people who stepped up to help you bootstrap this thing off the ground via your Kickstarter campaign was the trail running community. And I thought this would be sort of a heartwarming story to tell here on the podcast also. So maybe recount the the founding moment of MHBB coming back to your culinary profession. (sighs) Man feel old when you're like, it was so long ago. Um, yeah. So originally Nathan and I had a very, um, protracted vision. We were actually supposed to move into a different space in San Anselmo that was much smaller. Like we kind of were like, let's just mom and pop this. Like, let's not do some big crazy thing. And then a series of events led us to have the opportunity to take over the space where, um, we ended up opening up, but, you know, we were 30 at the time we decided to go forward with this and 30 year olds who have worked, worked in service industry, aren't exactly rolling in the dough, you know, with bakery opening money. (laughs) So, you know, one, the, one of the things that I did feel like I had, and like Nathan also was a part of that is like, we were a part of the trail community, like founding the trail community in Marin. And like, by 2013, like that is four years into when we had started the ninjas and everything else, like Brett had opened SFRC, like our community was so strong that I was like, I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, asking people for like 20 bucks at a time, you know, like that there's enough people who follow me and understand who we are as a runner and what we put into running that they will be able to say, if you put it in half as much as you put into running into this bakery, it will be a success. And like, it was really cool to kind of see people like really come with it. And we, I mean, we made well over, I mean, we had done something like really like we set the bar really low and then I think we made like double or something what we had planned on, you know, raising. So. It's a great story, right? Because the trail community did show up and we all know that it takes capital to start a business, especially something that requires a physical space like a bakery with probably an exorbitant rent in San Anselmo (laughs) here in Marin (laughs) County, California. But MHBB is an institution now and you guys are no longer involved and we'll come around and talk about that. But one of the things that you just mentioned was like you were part of like the founding group of people who put Marin County trail running on the map. Like obviously there were people that preceded you, but as trail running has grown, Marin County and the community here is like sort of one of the focal points or one of the geographies that's known for our sport, at least here in North America. As you mentioned, San Francisco Running Company was started around the same time as MHBB. I know you're close with Brett and Larissa, I wondered if there was any good stories from that time in your life or uh, yeah, just like anything you'd like to share about sort of the two of your families, right? The Rivers family starting SFRC and and you and Nathan starting MHBB around the same time, which are both now two institutions in Marin County. Both of you guys have exited your businesses, but like that effort lives on behind you. And I wondered if there's any great stories from those founding (laughs) moments. Yeah. I mean, I, I lived in the Bay area starting in 2005 and 
I was more of a road runner, ran my first ultra, which was headlands in 2006. And like at that time, I, all I wanted coming from a team sports background was like, where are my people? And I would like show up at road races and be like, hi, will you be my friends? And road runners were like, uh, no, <laughs> like there was, I was very actively trying to find like, where are my people? And like, I had friends, but like, there was no touch point for like, I know if I show up on Thursdays at five 30, like there will be people in this parking lot. Right. Like, and I moved to Seattle where I walked into, when I moved to Seattle, it was when Seattle running company was like kind of at its pinnacle. Like I got this, I got introduced to like Chrissy mail and like, as like here, have a friend. She's just like one of the greatest of all times. Like, you know, like be her friend and we are friends. And like, I, that had been kind of what I was looking for. And Seattle wasn't the right fit. I grew up in Seattle. So I went and I was like, ah, too much rain. Bye. So <laughs> when I moved back to the Bay Area, it was in part because when I had been traveling kind of over between 2007, when I moved to Seattle in 2009, I started cultivating more friends in that community and like more connections. And that's actually like a Bay Area runner is who actually introduced me to Nathan. So the best story is actually how I met Brett and Larissa and Nathan. Yes. Um, so basically a friend of ours sent me this email being like, here's the man of your dreams. And then, but wouldn't actually introduce us in person. He was like, Oh, you'll meet him. You'll just like run into him. I was like, that logically makes no sense. We live in San Francisco. But then my sister ran into Nathan on the trail. And so Nathan and I, she was like thin enough line, send him a Facebook message on ye old Facebook, as I now call it. Um, <laughs> so Nathan and I started talking. It was right before my birthday. And so Basically, on my birthday, I invited him and like randomly Brett and Larissa, who were like, like followed me, but I didn't know them. Like I had not met them. So I invited Nathan, Brett and Larissa, and then the person who wrote this email and then their friend, who was Caitlin, who I had raced before with. And I, we went on a run in the headlands. And like, so basically it was really a ploy for me to like hang out with Nathan, but like Brett and Larissa got to come too. And like it... It was, they definitely need to tell you their side of the story, but I think that they were a bit like, Devin, well, Devin Crosby Helms wants to run with us. <laughs> yeah. So we all went on this run and uh, Nathan brought me a watermelon as my birthday present. And then basically, because we had such a good time, like we all started doing this thing that I eventually named the Ninja. Like we just were like, hey, are you a weirdo who wants to run and the trails at five 30 on Thursdays. And like, so the three of us were just kind of like, yeah, that sounds totally normal. And like, <laughs> as like, we just all became really close friends. And I mean, like, I mean, Larissa's practically had a baby on the floor of MHBB. So we we're like friends, friends, like real friends yeah, who like, yeah. you know, would catch your baby as it comes flying out kind of friends. <laughs> <laughs> what a great story. So coming back to the bakery, like I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about the realities of owning that business. We talked a little bit about the, the founding moment. I'm sure a lot of people listening have worked in the service economy, if not in a restaurant or a bakery themselves. But the operation side of things is probably underappreciated. I know it's a notoriously hard business, low margins, long hours. So maybe provide some perspective as somebody who's actually been through it. What are the realities of owning that type of a business? Yeah. I mean, now it's really funny when never, people have always said to me, Oh, I'd love to own a bakery. And I, I'm just, I was like, don't roll your eyes at them. Like I get like a twitch because I'm like, it, it's said in such a way that it sounds so romantic and like, you know, great British baking show makes baking seem really romantic. But like, I, I think people just didn't under necessarily understand the fact that we were actually operating like three businesses. Like we had a wholesale business, which we were delivering bread sometimes in my mini Cooper from like the Golden Gate Bridge to like Healdsburg, right? Like that, it, that alone is 
a standalone business. Then we had a retail yeah. bakery and we had a cafe. Like the early days, like Nathan and I were so naive. Like, so it's like, we just basically committed to running the hardest ultra of our life with no information and like no supplies. And like, just all we knew is we weren't going to quit. <laughs> and I mean, it's like some of the things like I think about now that I kind of normalized, it's like, it's so ridiculous. Like Nathan would go to work at midnight like he'd go to sleep at like eight. He would go to work at midnight. I would run to the bakery at like two 30 in the morning and we would work until we were done. And I was baking at the time and operating the business. My best friend from Seattle, Jonathan had moved down to run the front of the house. He was sleeping on our couch. Like, like it's, it's so funny to me in hindsight, like how bootstrapped we were in the early days. Like there was nothing, like we just didn't have the money. So we would, we did everything. Yeah. And like people, like from the moment we opened the doors, like the first day we were overwhelmed. We were like, we were sold out and we're in the back, like three of us, like Nathan's old coworker from Tartine had come up to help us. And we're just in the back, like what's the easiest thing to make more of <laughs> like, so we can actually sell something. Um, yeah. I mean the first, I would say the first two years were just like relentless and like, yeah. it was hard for me because I feel like that's, that was a really big growth point in the Bay area trail running like boom. And I kind of felt like I was like, I had been a part, I had to help the ball get rolling. And then I couldn't engage in the same way. Mm. And I was still trying to race. Like I was still like fully in that mindset of like, I still want to have a running career, but at the same time I'm working, you know, 14 to 16 hours a day. And when you work with your spouse, you're really working every morning, every moment you're like cognizant. So yeah. <laughs> like, how's your coffee and what's payroll this week? Like, <laughs> you know, Very true. um, I, I think ultimately like it's hard in the way an ultra is hard. Like things happen where you're like, you feel like it's a dead end and you're sitting in that chair and you're like, I cannot go on. And like, but the reality is, it's like, you don't have a choice, right? <laughs> like in that regard, like PG and E turns the power off for two weeks. N nobody cares. They still, your employees still need to be paid. Your rent still has to be paid. Like you have to figure it out. And it, it's actually funny to think about like COVID now and like how that affected us because we were actually supposed to sell on March 21st of 2020 was the closing date. Whoa. And instead, Wait. and instead oh. we had to lay everybody off and work just the two of us for like three months straight. Okay. Well, I want to hear about that too, but maybe we can just pause for a second on this, this uh, metaphor or similarity between owning the business and your running career. Obviously it's not easy to have a bakery and work 14 or 16 hours a day and also compete at a world-class level. I'm sure you've meditated many times about the similarities and differences between these dueling professions and the times when you were successful in ba balancing the two and, and times when you weren't with some perspective. How are you, th how do you think about that? You know, with, with hindsight, do you feel like the, your running career in some way helped you guys weather some of those moments of acute pain and anxiety on the business front and vice versa. That's, do you think your MHBB days have in some way allowed you to run 300 miles at further last week? Oh, I mean, they, I definitely do think, especially in the early days, like I think the endurance it takes to run, you know, ridiculous distances. And like when we, when we opened, Nathan had done hurt, he had done hard rock, like, and I had paced him at all of those events. And like, but having that level of capacity to like do something physically difficult, like part of what we were doing was physically difficult. Like, it's not just like, we're like working on a computer for 14 hour days. It's like, I'm standing on my feet, lifting up 50 pound buckets of dough. Like, so in a lot of ways you can just tap into that, like that, that sense of like, well, I know my body's not going to break down, you know, like, what does it take? You know, you're, you're like, Oh, I can't do this. And it's like, oh, okay, maybe I just need to eat something. 
Like (laughs) maybe I need a nap. Um, I do think that the skills, it's one of those things where it's like a feedback loop though, because like I bring in skills to the bakery from running and then I take that skill that I'm like, Ooh, look how I handled that situation creatively. And then I bring that into running and it kind of fed each other because like, I remember in 2015, I ran Havelina and like, I hadn't run a hundred since 2007. And I went into that race and I was like, shit's going to be easy compared to like a week at the bakery. Right. Like I was like, I'm already prepared. Like I know how to stay up all night. Like I don't need to, like, I don't have to train certain things because I had the confidence in doing something that felt much higher stakes. Right. So it just made it, it did make it feel easy. And like, especially it's really funny for how well my running went in 2020, given the fact that I was also like, we were basically went from like, I am at the finish line. Nope. Just kidding. Like the fact that Nathan and I could pivot and then so successfully weather COVID like it, it kind of showed me exactly where we were in our like, like mastering kind of what we had been doing. Um, and I mean, we were like, I needed to be ready, like dressed and ready at seven 30 every morning. And I still ran like 15 miles every day before I was at work. Like there were days I did the, uh, wings for life one day before work. And I ran, I think I ran 52 K and like three thirty, and like literally at 8 AM open the doors and sold people pastries, you know? And I was like, <laughs> Commitment. I was like <laughs> Commitment. I, yeah, it, it just, I don't know. And I think, I do think that at least for me, and I think for Nathan too, like we are the type of people who can single singularly focus on like what we are doing and like, be like, this is what is important now. And like prioritize that in a way that it's just like other things fall by the wayside. And it's not like, I'm not distracted. I'm not worried about the, what those other things are. It's just like, this is like the ability to go all in, I think is, you know, part of our character versus like, that's not, that's not the way everybody is. Right. Like it's just not. It's so, such a good point. And talking about the COVID chapter, it sounds like you were on the precipice of selling the business and then maybe the deal fell apart. And I was actually talking to Corinne and she had mentioned that existential moment for you guys where she was going in and helping out at the bakery when you had to sort of lay off the staff and everything was very uncertain So I I don't know if there's anything more you want to say about that acute moment of suffering or in general, how the acute suffering that comes with small business, like how that took a toll, because eventually you did sell the business. So you could take us through that moment too. what made you and Nathan ready to exit and, you know, whether there were conflicting emotions about it, too, because you could almost view it as, you know, a retirement moment for an athlete too. like you guys had built that thing for 10 years And, you know, it's time for the next chapter. I'm sure there's some conflicting emotions there too. Yeah. I mean, we, like I said, we had originally planned to do something very small and like more energetically sustainable, you know, like we, we didn't go in with the intention of running a $3 million business, like (laughs) with 40 employees, like that, that, that ages you very quickly. Um, (laughs) And I think it was also coupled with the fact that one, we couldn't afford to live in the place that we were serving. And like the biggest piece for us was, and this I think speaks to our relationship with our friend group, including Brett and Larissa is like, we had this group of five couples and then Kristen and Galen Burrell moved away. And then Brett and Larissa moved away. And we had initially decided to stay in the Bay area and not open a bakery somewhere else because Brett and Larissa had chosen to stay there. So we stayed to be with our friends. And when they left, it was this moment of like, do we want, is this where we want our forever home to be? Mm -hmm. And like, yes, we had a successful business, but then when you start, when it is successful enough that you're not like head down, just 
making it through the day and you're like, hey, do I want to start over with a new friend community and like all of this stuff? Like uh, we still had friends, but like the closeness of that group, it, it just kind of made us be able to evaluate that and be like, is this sustainable? And I, I think, you know, the biggest toll was on Nathan, like just like how much he was putting into that. And it's, I definitely feel like my ability to hold boundaries with like work-life balance is slightly better than his. And so it's like, it was also just like, do I want to see this like ultimately burn Nathan out. And it's like making that choice before it's a reality is responsible. And, you know, we, we started a process that was very slow. Like we weren't like, we didn't want to be like, we're selling now and we get, get the, get us the fuck out of here kind of feeling yeah. right. Like it was very slow. And we, and because of the uniqueness of what we were selling, we knew it was going to take time and the right vision and understanding because like, even in the industry, what we were doing is very unique. And so therefore, like when people look at it on paper, they don't necessarily understand why does this cost this much when X, Y, and Z like, and so interestingly, the buyer that we, we ended up selling to is the same person that we were in contract to sell at the beginning of 2020. It was just basically, he was like, I would be the biggest fool in the world to like take over your business when we don't know what this is. And like, I 100% respect that. And like, I think that, that, you know, transition from like, we're out of here to like full stop 180, like at that point, it's almost, I think it's kind of like how you are at like how we are at this point in our ultra running career. It's like, it's not what is going to happen. It's like, you're, you're just kind of like, there's the plot twist. Like when something goes smooth, I'm like a right. little, like, I don't, I don't believe this. Right. Like, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't like blindside us. It like definitely was like, okay. You know, you're like, well, thought the finish line was three miles away and turns out it's a thousand to three miles. So going to take a minute and then just go forward. And like, you know, like having Corinne and like we had somebody from the neighborhood who came in and they volunteered and they made it like, we're just like in this together. It made it, it made it feel different. And it didn't like, we were never really in, in jeopardy of like going out of business during that time. Like, we having no employees is makes the business way, yeah. way, way more successful. So like, it was one of those things where it was more like, okay, how yeah. do we get through that initial uncertainty? And then how do we get this thing back on track? And once the world stabilized a bit, like I would say the period, the, like the last six months of being in ownership was probably more uncomfortable just because you're like, are we doing this? Are, you know, like, you're like, I think we're leaving. I think we like, you're kind of inching back towards that finish line, but you're also like, I don't want to commit. Like either we're going to just say, screw it, let's stay and figure it out. Or this is going to happen. And like, we just had to exist in that in between for a while because every time we thought we were like, I think I see the finish line. It'd be like the landlord would be like, no, I'm going to make a problem. Or like something would happen where you'd just be like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing this story. It's it's interesting for me as somebody who is a frequent and loyal customer and who still goes and gets my bread from the bakery. You'll be happy to know that the legacy does live on. And I hope that gives you some amount of satisfaction, you and Nathan both. Before we get to the next chapter of your life, I want to come back to your running because you were sort of like one of the original crossover athletes, I feel like, like you and Max King and Mike Wardian in a lot of ways, sort of those in our generation who were at least successful across road and trails and stuff. But in my opinion, you've been like disproportionately good at hundred milers. And I thought this would be an interesting thing for us to talk about. Like you've been on the podium at Western States. You've won Havelina twice. You've won Leadville. You just had that great run at, cold water at the beginning of the year 
et cetera. But you've also been on the road 100K Worlds team. You've done two oceans and comrades, a lot of road marathons and stuff. And I think like, especially now, there's maybe that pressure to to specialize, right? And in my mind, you've been uniquely good at 100 milers, but you've made a point not to specialize in the way that like Jeff Browning or Carl Meltzer have. Share a few thoughts about just like, the arc of your career developing as an athlete and, and making it a point to, to not specialize. Yeah. I mean, when I came in the sport in 2006, it was very like when I crossed the finish line at Headlands 50 K, which was the 50 K trail championships that year. And I knew nothing. Of, I had no idea what I was doing. I literally had never run on trails really, except for like a lake sloop, which I don't really count that as trail running. <laughs> so we used to call it the road runners trail loop. Um, so when I crossed that finish line, such a like, good loop, by the way, it, such a good so, loop. So the best. But when I crossed the finish line, Cammy Semick, Nikki Kimball, Connie Gardner were like, who are you? And all we know about you is that you run marathons too. So you should come be on the hundred K road team. And I was like, okay. Like I, to me in those early years. And I think this, there was a period of time in which everyone like Ann Trayson amazing on the roads, right? Like Ann Trayson had uh, until Camille came on the scene, like Ann Trayson still had most of the world records on the road and things like that. Right. There wasn't the specialization then. And then there was kind of this rise in a, in specialization. And I just, for me, like, even though there was a lot of pressure put on me to choose one, I always went back to what I said when I started running, which is I want to run forever, right? So I had to choose how to navigate that. So, I, you know, I will do something and I'll be like, marathon, marathon, 100K, marathon. And I'll be like, eh, I'm kind of bored of this. Like, let's jump over and run, you know, the next thing or change gears and, so early in my career, I just did everything. Like my first races in 2007, which was like my first full year, it was like Jed Smith, Mad City, 100K, um, TRT 50 mile, which was my first 50 miler, which is pretty gnarly. And I had the, I had the course record until like four years ago or something. Like, and like, I just followed my interest. Right. And I was like, this feels good. I like training in this way. I, in 2008, I ran Vermont. Yeah. 2008 when I was supposed to do Western States as my first hundred miler, I had won my way in the Montreal ultra cup and then it got canceled. And so I did Vermont and I won Vermont in my first hundred. And I was like, like, yeah, I'm good at it. But like, it didn't, I didn't want to go down that path. And because at the time I was 26, right. The people who I looked up to in the sport, mostly everybody at the time was like my age now. And they were like, take your time with it. And like, don't, don't feel the pressure to just do that. You, I, and I did get a lot of pressure to run hundreds and like that, uh, there are many years in my career in which I'm like, I was judged because I didn't do a hundred miler, but like part of my character is like, I care what people think, but like not so much that I'm going to go out and like run a hundred miler because I think somebody's going to approve of it. So I took my time and I followed my, my joy and my instinct. And like anytime something started to feel stale, I would just be like, this is what makes doing what the way I do it so much fun is that there is like an infinite number of options at that buffet, right? Like mm -hmm. I can train for the Olympic trials, which I've done multiple times. I could run comrades. I can run Western States. I could try to get into hard rock, <laughs> you know, like I, I mean, I think it's funny because I don't think people realize like the most random shocking thing I ever did was like run ultra trail Cape town after I hadn't run an ultra in like, cause that was the beginning of bakery. So 2015 yeah. I went down and I ran ultra trail Cape town and I had to do it in road shoes because I 
and I was sponsored by Hoka at the time and they didn't have trail shoes that worked for me. And this was when it was like pouring rain and cold and everything. And everybody was like, that's not in your wheelhouse. And I was like, whatever I want is in my wheelhouse. Like I don't, and I, I mean, I, I loved it. And that's actually what precipitated doing Havelina and like taking another stab at the hundred mile distance because I was like, well, if I can run on this crazy like terrain and like almost die falling off a cliff and like run for 14 hours, I'm pretty sure I can go run around the desert for 14 hours. (laughs) But do you see the hundred mile distance as something that you're uniquely gifted at in the way that I'm interpreting things just as somebody who's been a long time observer of your career? I mean, it's funny because I think for all the success that I've had over the last several years in the hundred mile distance, it's like, it hasn't, it hasn't overcome the amount of times I was told that I wasn't for so many years. Right. So like, like logically when you say that, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am. But like, like I, I just internalize that, like, this isn't your thing. And like, you have to understand, I had everybody telling me everything wasn't my thing, right? Marathoners, they're like, you're an ultra runner. And then trail runners are like, you're a road runner. And then road runners are like, you're a trail runner. And I would just be like, hmm. Like, it was almost like I was just doing it in a way that it was really hard to interpret how people looked at what I was doing and what people were valuing. Like, I think of myself as like, like a really good comrades runner. Like I have three gold medals, which is the most any American has tied with Sarah Bard, right? Like I'm pretty good at that. Um, but now, I mean, over the last couple of years, I definitely think that like, I am definitely moving into my era where like hundred miles where like my, where I am in my career, my mentality and my skill set are all aligning to like, really make me dangerous at that distance. And also, you know, I look at where 10 years ago, I was like 50 miles are my jam. Like now the people running 50 milers are like extremely fast marathoners who it's like, yeah, I still like them, but like from a competitive standpoint, like a hundred miles or like a hard hundred K, I feel like, the fact that I am so durable and like can run like that. I I'm not getting to a hundred K and then like shuffling it in. Like I can run a hundred miles and run the whole time. Like Mm -hmm. I definitely think, "Eh, I think I can own that. Thanks for that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I, I think you might have a lot of hundred milers on the docket this year. So maybe we'll come back and talk (laughs) about that here at the end of the convo. We obviously need to spend a lot of time on further. So before we get to that, let's just like close the loop on the story of post MHBB when you guys moved out to Colorado. You now make your home in the Salida area, not far from Leadville, for those who are wondering where the heck Salida is. And it seems like there's a really great community that's been building there, especially since COVID. I think a lot of the folks from the Front Range and other parts of Colorado have recognized that as being such a perfect and livable area in the state. So just again, yeah, yeah, close the loop on that part of the story, going from restaurant life to, to homestead life and, you know, just fill the audience in on what you're up to now. Yeah. I mean, when we left um, California, we didn't know where we were moving. And like, you know, I said, Brett and Larissa, Kristen Galen, they all moved to Colorado. They all live in the front range. And Nathan and I, knew we didn't want to live in the front range because we didn't really have an interest in making a lateral move. And I jokingly say, say they wouldn't let us in Louisville anyways, because we don't have children. Um, <laughs> kind of true. Kind of true. Kind, kind, I mean, it's just like, not like, it's just not, I have hand tattoos. Nathan has tattoos everywhere. Like we are not the vibe in Louisville. Um, I don't know. You guys I know. <laughs> but like it, 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 like we were looking for somewhere that, checked a lot of boxes, but wasn't also like would allow us to actually afford to live in a way that we hadn't been able to in Marin. And like we, the plan had been to spend a year going around Colorado, testing out different places. We 
uh, tested out proximity to your old stomping grounds, just mm, down, 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 down Valley where, um, down Valley trash, shout out to down Valley trash. Um, <laughs> in Glenwood, talking Springs. About Glenwood Springs, yeah, yeah. A great town, a great town. I love Glen- And Nathan of course loved it because we were, had an Airbnb that was on the river and he could fly fish out of our house because Nathan's a fly fisherman. And the, the first thing anybody we met there would say was this place is really expensive. And I was like, next. (laughs) So we actually ended up in Salida because of Anna Mae Flynn and Gina Lucrezzi and Sandy Nypaver. Basically I love Leadville. Like I, I've raced Leadville. I've come out numerous times and stayed in Leadville. Courtney DeWalter was trying to recruit me to Leadville. And I was like, yeah, except for I don't like snow. So when we came, basically all I knew was that like Salida was where Anna Mae lived and Sandy lived. And I was like, let's just rent a place. So we got an Airbnb. Nathan and I, like I said, we had a plan to not live anywhere for a year. We were in Salida for two days. We looked at each other and we were like, well, fuck. Like, yep. I guess we're, I guess we're moving here. Like it just, wow. it just felt right. It just felt right. It felt like the environment's what we want. Like the trail running is amazing. Instantly, like the community, you know, of my friends showing up, having people and connections, um, the cost of living, you know, there's great fishing, there's great running. There's not crazy amounts of snow. Like we just, and we, so we were like, okay, we'll just rent for a year. I'm going to just, you're going to reveal everything about mine and Nathan's personality and, and, and what happens next. We rented a place and then and instantly then bought it from the owner. No. And then instantly <laughs> Nathan's like, let's get jobs so we can get a mortgage. <laughs> so we both got jobs. It's, it's we both got jobs because nobody gives you a mortgage if you don't have a job. Right, yeah, we had to be able to get a loan, but yeah. we ended up buying a, we found this place in Howard. So Howard is just outside of Salida. It's a thousand people. There's literally one business and it's a liquor store. Um, and we bought this farm and it's like, we are in the middle of nowhere. It's beautiful. We have good proximity to Slida, but like basically that was nine. Like we moved into this place like nine months after we left the Bay area. So we never really took that, you know, big long vacation we were planning on. And it feels so. right. It oh, seems yeah. like. Yeah. Go and ahead. then we got a thousand animals and now we're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll have to make sure we include that homesteading Instagram account yes. that you guys have set up. All right. So let's talk about further. My gosh, I guess before we get to it, one of the things that I'd love to hear about is the whole Lululemon phenomenon in the sport of trail and ultra running, because I think you know, for a lot of us, when they signed you and Leah and Camille, especially, it was like, wow, like Lululemon is making a very intentional play into our formerly tiny little sport. And it seems like they've created an amazing environment for you guys to flourish into with whatever goals you want to pursue. So I'm sure the audience would be interested to hear a little bit about the whole process of them starting this team from scratch. Obviously, they had had a little bit of exposure in the track and field and road world, but you guys were sort of the founding members of this trail and ultra team. So say a few words about that. Yeah, I think the the biggest point is that they didn't come into the space to start a team in the way that teams are kind of established in the space already, right? Like technically we are not a team, right? Like now that further is over, like we are – just global ambassadors. Like I am as much a teammate to Nikki Hiltz as I am to Camille. Like I, without further, like further is the team, right? Like further is what makes us a group, but I don't, Lululemon didn't look at the ultra running space and be like, that's where the next, you know, billion dollars comes from. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's how that went. Right. Like, and I don't think their intention has ever been to come into the space and build team, build a team in the way that other brands are right. Like it would not surprise me if the four of us 
Steph, Leah, Camille, and I like stayed the only trail ultra ambassadors in the next cycle. Like, I just don't, I don't think that that was their intention. I do think that they just like they're doing in track and field, they're growing into the run space. And like, I do think culturally like trail and ultra running has grown enough outside of being a niche sport that it is a viable market for them. And so, you know, wherever this spark came from, but like when we were brought on, it was, we are brought on as ambassadors with also like further was always a part of it. Like further was always like, this is what we hope to do. And like there, they would have, if I had said, I'm not interested, I would have regretted it for my whole life. But like, if I had said, I'm not interested, it was never like, we will only sign you if you say you'll run for six days. Like, yeah, obviously. I. But, but what that means though, for the audience is that what you, you signed with them a year and a half ago. And so this has obviously been a vision that's existed for a couple of years, at least from a brand level. Yeah, exactly. I found out the funniest thing that I found out after the fact was when I won Havelina in 2022, that a lot of the people that I now like love and adore and have worked with for a year and a half, there was a huge contingency of them at Havelina that year. Like not like watching me or Steph or whatever, like they weren't like watching us as athletes. They were like, observing like this amazing thing. Like they were there to be like, what is this all about? And I think they couldn't have picked a better race than Havelina to be like, of course, this is what, you know, like, (laughs) but it's just kind of funny to be like, Oh yeah. They were like, this burning man. Yeah. They were creeping on me. Um, (laughs) which was, so it's pretty amazing to find out in hindsight. I'll I'll be like, Oh yeah. When I did Havelina, they'll be like, I was there like the VP of, you know, like innovation. I was there. Like, (laughs) So add some detail on the research element of further, because I think this is one of the things that it was probably the most important factor of the whole six day extravaganza, but that may have gone over the heads of a lot of the people who are just passively observing. I know Emily Krauss and Megan Roche were there. So, I mean, just say a few words about that research initiative what sorts of data were they collecting and how they capture it and how do they plan to use it practically i mean i think it i definitely think it went over people's heads because people were like you know the few comments that were negative it's kind of like poo-pooing this like idea of doing this very ambitious project for like what to just have 10 people run around for six days for like feel good like no like the point was what breaking two did for science and moving like that sports science forward, like no one's done that for women. And so very clearly from the start was looking at how much women are being studied. It's not very much. And using this opportunity, a very unique opportunity to study women and perform like, I mean, I think I lost track, but at some point there was like 40 different papers that were going to be written. Like, it's not like they did one project and we're going to feel good about that. Like we looked at this from in so many different aspects where from my perspective, this should open a door to be like, okay, we studied X factor, you know, like biomechanics they had. I mean, I don't know if you guys could tell from like what you were seeing out there, but like there was a, we ran through a biometrics tent on every loop, like with force plates in the ground that they had to build like pour cement to put this whole thing together. And like, so every, every time we went through that tent, like they recorded like how we were moving for six days. Like that is insane. And that's just one of the projects, right? Like, and we're doing data on like what we're consuming, like how our bodies are burning fuel. Like, uh, I mean, we were taking blood samples, urine samples, like body weight data. We did DEXA scans before the race we had done like VO2 max testing and things like that. So like it was very complete. I mean, the day race ended on Tuesday, on Wednesday, like we had to, we had done a bunch of testing on Sunday, like four hours of testing. And then like the day after the race, they're like, and now you're going to do 
fasting blood tests and resting metabolic rate. And you're like, (laughs) I don't want to leave my bed. Right. I mean, even there was even somebody who was doing a, like a psychosocial um, project, which is interesting when you think about every time I'd come around on a lap and I'd see the person, the researcher, I'd be like, she's judging me. (laughs) What is, what is she observing about me in this environment? So like, I think that's the coolest part. And like people can argue like, what about this group or what about that group? It's like, we have a representation of basically 27 years old to 50, I think 50 years old. Like that, that's a pretty good starting place for the fact that no one has ever invested this much in studying women. And like, you have such a cross section of different abilities. Like it, it's not just a bunch of fast women. Like you have people who just started running, you know, people going through menopause, people early on in their career, people who had never run an ultra before. Like, I just think it's such an interesting thing to have those resources. And on the other side, it's like the people who are doing the research, we were also provided with, like the support of people like Trent Stellingworth and, you know, the Canadian sports Institute. So it's like, it's not just that they were taking from us the extracting this research. They were also supporting us and saying like, do you want to work with our strength training coach? You want to work with our nutritionist? We had access to what Olympic athlete athletes had access to. And so it's like, we were set up to be at our best and then also provide this amazing, like, just huge amount of like data sets. Like it's probably going to take like two years for them to go through all the data. Like, I was going to say, it's going to have a long tail impact in the sport. Obviously it was six days. It sort of owned Instagram. You may not have appreciated that because you were too busy (laughs) either running circles or probably laying in bed, but Holy smokes was it so fun to follow. And now, Obviously, there will be a lot to look forward to in that sports science department specific to pushing women's sport forward. So talking about your goals specifically, I'd love to hear a little bit about this. I know you ran Coldwater Rumble in January, I think is sort of like a quote unquote 100 mile training run and building (laughs) fitness and testing fitness before further. What were your goals for the six days and anything you want to say about the preparation going into it? I'm sure people would love to hear. I mean, my goal was to win and I um, took a very, um, I had a really, I had a lot of fun at the press conference revealing my goal since nobody actually, uh, for a long time, I had been very coy about like, I want to run to my potential because I think it's more effective to just drop the hammer and be like, this is like, Sports Illustrated and ESPN really appreciated it, at least. So, um, (laughs) like, my goal, I basically prepared myself to run as many miles as it was going to take to win. And I knew that Camille was going for the men's world record. And on paper and in theory, it seemed, based on my plan, very feasible. My training went really well. Like, I trained. I did a YouTube video every single day. You could deep dive as deep as you want to into that. Um, but like I took a creative approach to training. It was not, it was not very similar to anything else I've ever done. Like I sometimes would run five times a day, like five miles, five times a day. Like I prepared my body in a way to every day, just wake up and be like, this is what we do. We just move. And like, Mm -hmm. for me, the biggest aspect when I started my training in December, the thing that I knew was going to be the most important was the mental piece because I knew if you think about the highs and lows of a normal ultra now extrapolate it to when you're in the most pain, you're the most tired, you don't want to do this anymore. And you still have four days. Like I feel like that aspect, like more than just like averaging a hundred miles a week, like I came in very clear mentally and like with a very clear, um, like, what success looked like for me. Um, that wasn't a distance. And, you know, if you look at what actually happened for me, like I clearly did not run the miles that I had set out to, but like, I also do not feel, I feel like I succeeded because of 
the way that I handled what actually happened. And like one of the things that I, you know, I mean, you still ran 313 miles in six days. Exactly. And I took, and I, you know, and in the middle, I had to take 32 hours off completely. Right. Like, and it's like, I am very proud of the fact that when I was running amazing and I, you know, the first day I ran 115 miles, right. Like I knew I said to my crew with a little swagger on the first day, because Camille was running like seven minute pace. And I was like, I don't know if that's humanly possible for six days. It seems a little fast. Like I said to them, I'm playing the long game and 115 miles was more than I needed to average. And I felt good. And on the end of, so basically the middle of day two. So going into that night, I was put on a medical hold and I needed to, and I had to stop and I had to kind of go down the path of ensuring that my health was okay. Mm -hmm. And like, I didn't, that was, that you can't argue with reality, right? Like I, luckily I've worked with Emily Krause in the past, right? So we had already talked through how she would approach like her opinion, depending on where we are in the race. And I was like 160 miles into the race and like potentially like I felt we, we thought that I was developing a stress fracture. Right. Yeah. And it's like, at that point, if I was like day five and a half and on course for on pace for a world record, I would be like, break both of them. I don't care. I will, I will live. I will sunset myself off, like off. If I break the men's world record, I don't care. Walk off into the sunset I will here in wheel the off in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> but like, that, that point, it was like, my, my goal is in jeopardy. How do I want to handle it? And so we handled it appropriately by like giving me time to rest and see, like first I rested overnight and then I tried and it didn't feel better. So then we went and like, we investigated it and like made sure that like there was like, I didn't have a broken leg and like then every day we evaluate, evaluated it. And so day, basically the right start of day four, I came back out on course, like feeling good. I could pass the hop test there. There's plenty of explanation of what happened, right? Like it is a repetitive stress on anything that's the same over and over again. Like your body is going to react. And so I came back on day four and it's funny because Charlie Dark, mentioned on my Instagram post today about like the moment, like I kind of like came back out of my cabana and like, just like the fact that I returned, like that's all that mattered to me was like being out there with my team. And like, I ran 20 miles that day and I was like, Oh, I feel fine. And then, but at the same time, now that the goal is gone, how do I proceed? Like, how do I find a definition of like, I could just have coast run 20 miles a day, but like that didn't feel good either. So the next day I ended up running 50 miles and half of that, I ran at like eight minute pace and like we're on the second to last day. And I am, everybody is like, what? Like where? And to me, it, it showed to me that everything I built in training was true, right? Like that I, I am durable. I can like, I could feel this good at the end of the race. And whereas when I came back, I was like, maybe I can like get to 250 miles. And then I ended up getting over 300 because the last two days I ran, I ran 50 miles, 55 miles. And then like before 10 AM, I ran 28 miles. Like I, I'm very satisfied with the fact that for what happened and how I dealt with it, which is giving myself a lot of grace, like, I still actually ran an amazing race. Like we actually <laughs> calculated. ran a ridiculously incredible. I mean, days. I only ran for 58 hours out of 144. Like and you that's put down 313 <laughs> miles in yeah. 58 hours. That is sick. So I'm sure it's hard to capture the six day experience in words. In fact, that's sort of been the theme of a lot of the Instagram posts that have come out of it. Everybody's like, <laughs> speechless, not (laughs) sure how to articulate my feelings, but you know, this is a podcast. So maybe 
I'm sure you're still sort of collecting your thoughts, but share a bit about in what ways this maybe changed your perception of yourself or the sport in general, or if we want to get super spiritual and existential, how how it changed your perception on on life and existence on planet earth. I did all of those things. I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm actually grateful for the fact that I had to change my plan because I don't know if, if I had been singularly focused on competition, I think I would have missed out on some of the things that ultimately made this impactful for everyone. And it's like, you know, when I came back, my goal was not to like run an amount of miles that would make people care because it's like nobody can conceptualize running for six days. Like my goal was to be a teammate and like over the year and a half that we have worked on this project, like it's not just I'm close with my teammates. It's like, I'm close with the people who spent so much time working on the product, putting this event together, like filmmakers, videographers, like everybody put their heart and soul into this. And I just wanted to be present for that. And when I came back, it was like, I got to be part of Rico making it to a hundred miles. And like a year, a year ago, she couldn't run one kilometer without stopping. Like we. So cool. It, it's so like, incredibly cool. Yeah. I, I think you actually, it, like the way that you put it, which made me cry multiple times. Like every time I read it, I think is the best way for people to understand it without being there, which is like people understand what it means to be like the golden hour and like what that feels like and what it feels like for everyone who is a part of it. And it really was like six days of that. And like, that doesn't mean like people will be like, it's not all holding hands and, you know, making friends and blah, blah, blah. It's of course not. The golden hour is literally people who are like having the hardest time (laughs) trying to make it to a finish line by the skin of their teeth, right? Like there is plenty of hardship and struggle, but like further made it like into an experience where like, it's like, a, it's like going to the Olympics, except for with the Olympics, you theoretically could go back to the Olympics, right? You, the Olympics still exists. Like there is nothing that is going to be like this ever again. And I think that that's, the hard thing to articulate, and I've tried to say this, is like, I'm trying to explain an experience that most people don't get to have, right? Like, I can't be like, it's like X, right? Because this was so singular, right? Yeah. Like, the way it came together, like, I don't think anybody imagined this would be like what it was, right? That's the problem. It's like, I went to summer camp and I never want to go home, like we built a rocket and went to the moon. Like I, we, like you said, we were, it was golden hour for six days. And like that can't, you can't just walk away and be like, cool. See you at the next one. Like it just, (laughs) it's so true. I want it. I want you to build off this, but before we get to that, something I wanted to read here, something that I read yesterday that struck me and that feels appropriate to bring into our conversation here. And this is a quote from the CEO of NVIDIA, which is, of course, like the the hottest company on the NASDAQ right now, but a company that's been around for 30 years and is finally hitting its stride. And the CEO says, resilience matters in success. I don't know how to teach people it except to say, I hope suffering happens to you. Greatness comes from character and character is formed out of people who suffered. I wish upon you ample doses of pain and suffering. It's just like so perfect and beautiful. So what you were just saying, I want you to keep going on it about you posted something about how you were sort of mourning the fact that it was over and kind of one of the tragedies of being human is that it is hard to explain how impactful this was. Like you kind of had just had to be there to experience it and we only get a few of these in our lives that are so meaningful and so deeply touching. Like it just doesn't happen every day. I'm sure, you know, it's sort of hard to 
come down after such a massive physical and emotional <laughs> undertaking, but maybe share a little bit about what the aftermath has been like. I mean, I think that quote is perfect because the amount of, you know, the, the not, not necessarily what, I mean, plenty of cry pictures ended up on the internet, obviously, but like watching somebody cry or have a low moment doesn't actually like you can't, you're not feeling what their suffering is. And like everybody had a day in which they were like at their lowest and could not find a way to keep going. And like, on those days, that's when somebody would just come and be like, just come with me for one lap or whatever. Right. Like, and that's the unique part of this is that because we cared so much about each other, that that became the thing that mattered the most was not like my singular race or my goals or like whatever, like you always had the energy to help out your friend. Right. Like I made it to 300 miles on the last morning and I was like, I still feel fine, but like, I don't like what I have like three hours. What's my motivation? Like, I'm just sitting there like, it kind of feels arbitrary. I'm not going to make it to 350. So like, yeah, like, so what? And I hear out, I was next to Leah, like her, uh, we were next to each other. And I hear her husband, Mike say, Leah, you just need to run a half marathon in three hours. Like, that's all you need to do to make it for 400 miles. And I was off that bed and I walked out and I said, if you want my help, I will get you there. And she had been having a really hard time. Like it had like running 400 miles is freaking hard. And she was like, at that point, like, why? Right. Like, why am I like, who cares? And like, it's like to have that connection. It was like, she can do it if I can do it. And we went out there and she got her goal. And it was like, that's all that mattered to me. And it's like, moving away from like coming out of this, right? Like one of the hardest things to reconcile with like moving forward. It's not that I'm not going to have fun races or good times or whatever. It's like this, these conditions will never exist ever again, like in that way. And all of us, like everybody, like Nathan was there crewing me and like the, he came home, the day after the race. And like, he was like, I feel lost. Like everybody who's been a part of this, it's like, how do you go back to real life after something like that? And and it's like, we are, have become so close with so many people and spent so much time that like finding a way to transition out of this is like, I don't have it figured out. Right. Like, but I do know that like, just because it's over didn't mean it didn't happen. And I can go back, I can go back and I can think about that. I can look at a picture. It's very easy to make me cry right now. I just like go read somebody's Instagram post and I'm like, waterworks. Mm." I I tried to read Nathan a comment on one of my posts and I started crying, you know, like, (laughs) and, and it's like, yes, it's going to be different. Like we're never going to be in this environment ever again in this way. But like the 10 of us are already making plans for like, where are we going to go hang out? Like who, who's going to show, who's going to show up for me? Where, like, how can I support you in your thing? Like, how can we integrate our lives in a way that continues that bond and like, doesn't just let it like dissolve and let this thing kind of be like, remember when, you know, like, so I feel like everybody wants to hold on in a, and we're just working and supporting one another and figuring that out. And like, also being very conscious that like after any big effort, there can be this really big come down, like naturally, like outside of this environment, that is true. And like ensuring that like no one goes into a place that like they, like we're trying to soften the blow for each other because like this could be really hard. Like this, this could be like a very, like after this high of a high, there could be a very low, low and like, just being conscientious to continue to keep the magic going and the conversation so that we are still supporting each other, even though the event is over. So true. Just like character friendships are born through pain and suffering. I wish you ample doses of pain and suffering. You know, as a dad now too, like, you know, the, the instinct for me oftentimes is like, I'll protect, protect the kiddo, protect the fam. 
And, you know, he's going to need that pain and suffering. We all need the pain and suffering. And so yeah. it's almost compassionate to like you did with Leah, you know, yeah. just be there for somebody while they're in the pain and suffering. It's yeah. so, so beautiful. This is why sports are the best for God's sakes. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, all right. So how do we wind down now? I think, you know, you, you talked, we talked earlier about your versatility and I sort of shined a light on the fact that at least in my opinion, you're like just a really good hundred mile runner. Obviously you already crushed cold water in January. Be, you're in at Western States based on your grindstone performance last year. And I noticed that maybe you're going to be doing the full grand slam this year. So start winding us down here by telling us about, you know, in what ways, you know, this further experience now informs the next chapter of your competitive life and what that looks like. Yeah. So I guess you could be, I could make my big announcement that I'm doing the comrades grand slam. Cause I am doing comrades <laughs> oh, still. God. It's three weeks. It's three weeks ahead of Western States. So it's almost perfect. It has in recent years only been two weeks. So three weeks at this point, it's not like four hours. So I feel very confident. <laughs> in that. Um, yeah. I mean, I going into this year, knowing further was on the docket and like ha having the grand slam in the back of my head, like I always knew this year was going to be big. And like at this point in my career, I'm like, why not? Why not do all of the things? And like, I think the way that further went and the way I'm coming out of it, like I actually feel extremely confident going into the grand slam. And like Leah and I had a conversation on that last day together where we are kind of looking at it as like a, an advantage to kind of have run this far when most people haven't like it does change your perspective on running a hundred miles. Like the amount of problem solving you have to do in a six day, like a lot of that stuff will never even come into play in a hundred miler. And like the fact that in a six day you could feel like crap for like two days straight and then, you know, feel great. Like it just, it just means that being on the, the start line of Western States, I just feel more competent than I have in the past and like more curious just to see how doing something like this will inform that experience. I mean, the last time I did Western States, I mean, I was supposed to do it last year, but I got COVID. Uh, <laughs> live in a bubble for the next three months. Um, yeah. Like the last time I did Western States, I was still in my 30s and I still cared a lot about what people said. And I had multiple things happen to me before that race and during that race that did affect me mentally. And they were not, as the story has been told, they weren't a function of me being emotionally weak. It was a function of like people, like just my sensitivity to the way that people interact with me and like mm. I I mean you I still, still finished third place we should say it, exactly you still finished on the podium of western states exactly exactly and I like and so for me to look at that and be like well that a lot went wrong in that race and I still finished really well and now I feel that I'm much more prepared and much more of a hundred mile racer like I'm excited to run western states and I I truly feel like at this point in my career, whether I have an amazing performance or I, an average performance or a crappy performance that like, I am the most prepared to give it everything I have. And I'm very excited to do the grand slam because I feel like that kind of challenge is like perfect for me. And like, I have wanted to do it for a really long time, but I feel like now I'm like, I'm not, and I'm not trying to participate in the grand slam. I'm trying to race. Like Awful. we've seen that. We've seen that on the men's side where like men run each race competitively, but like you really don't see that on the women's side. And like for all the years that I've had that in mind, like I have always wanted to show that you can do this and be competitive. So that's like my goal going in. We'll see what happens. Awesome. 
uh, just for our listeners, the grand slam of ultra running. This was something that was big in the zeitgeist when you and I were coming up, Devin, but it's Western States, Vermont 100, Leadville 100, and Wasatch 100, all in the span of, what is it, 10 or 12 weeks, it must be? Yeah, and I think there's like anyway. three or four weeks in between each, so. Such a worthy goal, and you are clearly primed to knock it out of the park. Devin, we're already at 90 minutes. This has been so fun. We could go three hours, but you just ran for six days. So let's wind down here and we can pick it up at any other time in the future. My closing question is for everybody, who is one person that you admire? That person could be inside or outside of sport, living or dead. And why do you admire that person? Mm, I mean, I was going to just continue on with my teammates, but I think we've all est- we've all established how, what I think about my teammates. They're all wonderful. Um I actually am going to, I'm going to, the answer that I'm going to give you almost sounds cliche, but it's, once I explain why I'm saying this, um, will sound less cliche. So, um, Courtney DeWalter, who is actually my friend, um, I don't actually, I'm actually going to (laughs) get choked up saying this. Courtney does amazing things. She races amazing. That is not at all like the thing that makes me admire her as a friend. She is someone who is extremely thoughtful. And like, I will be like, Hey, congratulations on Western States course record. And she'll be, th- she'll be like, thanks. How are you? How's COVID? Are you okay? And you're like, what? Like she, like when I, uh, like before cold water, I was having a melty because of like really weird pre-race anxiety. And I was texting with her and I was like, can I just like borrow your brain for like the first half? And she was like, Devin, you have all the skills in the world. Like I have no doubt that you don't need my brain. You have your brain. And it's like, <laughs> she is just somebody who is extremely kind and thoughtful and like doing it for the right reasons. Right. Like there is not, I have, I am highly skeptical of really nice, healthy people. (laughs) And I've always been like, she might have bodies in her basement. She's too nice. But like, (laughs) that's the thing. It's like, it is really refreshing to be around someone who is excelling at what they're doing and also 100% supportive of you like doing the same thing. Like there is no, she has no scarcity mindset. Like we went on a run last year together in Leadville and we were joking about having a sprint finish at the track. And she was like, well, it'll be a sprint finish as long as you give me a mile's head start because you're way faster than I am. And I'm like, you know, it's like, I just love that somebody who is that competitive can also be, who she is and like that it's just really good for our sport and it having experienced it personally, I can say that it is genuine and like it also makes me want to show up for other people in the way that she does. Oh God. Perfect. What a dismount, Devin. (laughs) I so agree with everything you just said. And that is why people like you and I, have been in the sport for 18 years is because you don't get that anywhere else. Yeah. And she is, we are all so lucky to live in the Courtney DeWalter era. And I, I, yeah, what a perfect way to end the conversation. Devin yeah. Yanko, congratulations on further. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Let's Thanks. talk again soon. Thanks for having me.